Tangent. There we go. All right. First John chapter two. We left off at verse eight, which talks about new commandment, old commandment, both the same, and the commandment is love, right? Love is what we are to do. So we'll pick up at uh, verse 9, just as soon as I find my spot here, and uh, we'll go from there and continue to try and finish this chapter tonight, which we should. John says, the one who says uh, he is in the light, knows that's capitalized, so you're in Christ, yet hates his brothers in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, I said the light, in, at least in my translation, is capitalized, which is a reference to Christ. So it's not just light, it's Christ. It's talking about Christ. So... In this section, or starting this section, you have a comparison contrast, so to speak, uh, of light and darkness and hate and love. If you look there at verse uh, 9, it says, John writes, if a person claims to be in the light, to be in Christ, but uh, hate their brother in Christ, they're in darkness. They're not in Christ. They're not in the light until now, meaning that's a light, dark uh, comparison or contrast there. Uh, and to be in the darkness means to not be in Christ, to not have a spiritual uh, relationship with God. Verse 10, the one who loves his brother, of course, again, in Christ, abides or remains in the light, in Christ. Thus there is nothing that will cause him to stumble, to sin, nor his action to cause him to stumble, sin, uh, Love, hate is that comparison there. And then verse 11, those that are in darkness, you're separated from God. Walk, live in darkness as in a part separated from Christ. They do not know or realize where they are headed, which is hell, because the darkness blinds them. Now I'm going to read you the Amplified Translation version. Kind of fills it in and just to me makes it a little bit more clarified. Uh, and I've said this a lot of times, you know, you're reading a scripture and you say, yeah, I really don't get it. Look at it in different translations. If you have a computer, go online, BibleGateway.com. There's probably 30, 40, 50 translations there that you can look at various passages to gain the understanding. So the Amplified, same verses, 9 through 11, reads this way. The one who says he's in the light, in consistent fellowship with Christ, and yet habitually hates, works against his brother in Christ, is in the darkness until now. The one who loves and unselfishly seeks the best for his believing brother lives in a light. And in him there is no occasion for stumbling or offense. He does not hurt the cause of Christ or lead others to sin. But the one who habitually hates, works against his brother in Christ, is in spiritual darkness and is walking in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So those who have blinded spiritual eyes are not living in the manner that God, that Christ wants them to. Uh, they might be running from God, or maybe they've been deceived by Satan into believing in a false God or no God. Now, this is true even for people still today. So, my question, how do people walk in darkness today? Darkness is being separated from God. They're spiritually dead. So, how do people do that today, walk in darkness? All right, they're in the world. The world is more important to them. I'll take 
take that and go over and run with it. Anything else you can think of? How do people walk in darkness today? When you witness to somebody and they say, I don't want to hear this. Why would they say they don't want to hear it? Because they're walking in darkness. <laughs> <laughs> deny God. All right, they deny God exists. Or they believe in another God. Yeah, so they're in spiritual darkness. They've been deceived by Satan into thinking there is no God or uh, Allah is God or Buddha is God or whatever the case may be. What can we do to shine the light of Christ into their lives? Witness. Witness? Not only talk it, but live it. Live it. What can we do to shine the light into an individual's darkness? Pray. Pray? Unconditional. Anything else? Love. Love. That's the word I've been waiting on. We have to love them, but how do we love them? Tit for tat? How? Yes. Did you say something? Unconditionally. Unconditionally. It, it, it's God, Christ loves us unconditionally. It's not, well, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type love. It's not a brotherly love. And you think about all the people you know in this world who are lost, don't know Christ. They might claim to, but you, you don't see any fruit in their lives. It can be hard to love them unconditionally, can it? You know, I remember years ago working with a guy. I could not hang around him. It's like every other word was a cuss word. It just, you know, ran through me. But I'm supposed to love him unconditionally. Is it easy? No. Some people, you know, uh, as the Bible says, it's easy to love those who love you. Love those who don't love you. That's what we are. All right, uh, 12 through 14. He says, I'm writing to you, little children, because you, your sins have been forgiven you for his Christ's name's sake. I'm writing to your fathers, because you know him who, have, who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have, oh, because you have overcome the evil one. Who's the evil one? Say, and I have written to you, children, because you know the Father, and I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. All that makes clear sense, right? Here's what, uh, now, little children, of course, is one way that John uh, addresses believers. The Holman Commentary on 1 John writes this about these verses. These verses are difficult to understand, and they do not have a strong connection with what the verses before or what comes after. These verses seem to be reassuring us that we are, in fact, Christians. They contrast the spiritual status of believers with the assessment of self-praising false teachers. Now, remember, Gnostics is who John was basically writing against. They held the ordinary believers could not know God because, well, you had to receive that special knowledge. And if you didn't have that special knowledge, you couldn't understand scriptures, you couldn't have a relationship with God. Now, again, I'm going to go back and read these verses in the Amplified. Again, it just, to me, it helps understand it a little bit better. So the Amplified translation, John says, I am writing to you, little children, believers, dear ones, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. You have been pardoned and released from spiritual debt through his name because you have confessed his name, believing in him as Savior. So that's, you have been forgiven. Uh, I am writing to you fathers, those who those believers who are spiritually mature, because you know him who has existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men, those believers who are growing 
in spiritual maturity because you've been victorious and have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children, those who are new believers, those who are spiritually immature, because you have come to know the Father. And I have written to you fathers because you know him who has existed from the beginning. And I've written to you young men because you are strong, vigorous, and the word of God remains always in you. And you have been victorious over the evil one by accepting Jesus Christ. Christ as Savior. So I believe John writes this section as a reminder to Christians and kind of leading into the next section. Now, note he says, starts off in there, I'm writing as in right now, and then it's I have written as in the past. So it's kind of a reflection where he knows them. It's not a, I never, we never met, we have no idea who you are, but these are people that he has had a relationship with. All right, so let's look at verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All right, this is a repeated command, command, for to love the world is to not have God's love in you. Do you agree or disagree with that? To love the world means you don't have God's love in you. You agree or disagree? Right. Yeah. Anybody disagree? We all agree. All right. Do you know that Satan is the prince of this air, of this world? Yes. Which is, yeah. This is his domain. Doesn't mean he controls us. God gave us all free will. We choose. But this is where he can tempt us. He cannot go and kick God out of his throne. He does not have power there. His power is limited. So he's the prince of, the, uh, prince of this era, of this world, and that's why John writes. So he says, do not love the world because Satan is the prince of this world. For to love the world means you love evil. Can you see that today? People who are evil or do evil acts love the world. Uh, Ephesians 2, 2, uh, again, amplified translation. You are following the ways of the world. You're influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, accordance with Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving, who fight against the purposes of God. So you're following the world's ways. You're following Satan's ways. He's got you hook, line, and sinker. Romans 2.2. 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So the word conform means fit into a mold. So don't fit into the mold of the world. Instead, change the way you think. Look at everything through the scriptures. May not always be easy, but we need to do it. In James 4, 4, he says, you adulterous, you've gone against God. You're worshiping something or someone else. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now think about those verses, Ephesians 2, Romans 12, 2, and James 4, 4. And then you go back and look at verse 15. Do not love the world. Is it clearer? Does it make even more sense? There are, unfortunately, churches that are friends of the world today. Would you agree or disagree? There are plenty of Christians who are friends of the world, or they claim to be Christians, but are more friends of the world. You know, because they'll say, well, the Bible's out of date, uh, that doesn't matter anymore, times have changed, uh, and as the scripture says, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So, don't be like the world. Now look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, <clears throat> lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, 
and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. From. Now, who's the prince of this world? Satan. So if it's not from God, it's from Satan. Satan. Okay? So let's look at this. Satan's domain leads us in three general directions. I, I say all sins fall under one of these three categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. These are not from God, but as I said, they are from the world, they are evil, they are from Satan. So, some examples. Lust of the flesh. Adultery. Overeating because my body says it's hungry. You know, I, I talk about my chocolate bars. You know, do I need them? Maybe every now and then, but... You know, the body wants it. Or, you know, some people crave sweet. Some people crave salty. You know, and, and so our body wants. It's a lust, desire of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. See it, I want. I, I want that new car, that new truck, new tractor. You buy a new tractor? You know, uh, it, it could be clothes, houses, automobiles, any. Thing. You see it, you want it, you gotta have it. Pride of life, I deserve it. I've worked hard. I deserve this. Uh, I deserve this promotion. I deserve this job. I deserve this bank account. I deserve whatever. Prideful. Uh, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and the fall. Adam and Eve in the garden, one tree, God says, do not eat the fruit from this one tree. Eve's walking by one day, old Satan comes out, he says, you see this apple? You eat it, and you'll be like God. So what does she do? Well, she looks at it and goes, you know, it looks like it's pretty tasty. Lust of the eyes. I am kind of hungry. Lust of the flesh. To be like God? Pride. Boom. Honey, have a bite. That's where it starts. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All, in my opinion now, I can't prove this, but this is my opinion, all sins fall under one of those three categories. You name me one that doesn't fall under. While I wait on that, let's go to 217. The world, <clears throat> the world is passing away, and also it's lust, the three we just mentioned. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So the world is temporary, right? We're here temporarily. This world is only going to last temporarily. There's going to be a new heaven, new earth. We saw that at the end of Revelation. You talk about that Sunday? Will you be talking about it or has it already gone over it in Sunday school? Repeat that. Repeat. The new heaven and new earth. We've already we covered that. About it. Well, yeah. some of it, yeah. We have talked about it, but we're going to talk Sum it up. Sum it up. I, I, I could remember. All right, so this world's temporary. The lust of the world is temporary. But whoever does God's will lives forever, not temporary. Hence, doing God's will, which is the opposite of loving the world, provides possession of eternal life and living forevermore. Uh, again, the Holman Commentary paraphrases verses 15 through 17 like this. Do not embrace the world's way for goods. When you do, it squeezes out your love for God. When you live forgetting your own way and, forget, and forgetting everything you want, and for looking good compared to others, you're not living for God, but for the world. This is foolish because it suffocates your relationship with God, and in the end, it'll all go up in smoke anyway. You could be the richest man in the world ever. And when you die, what's going to happen to your riches? 
You can't take it with you. And if and if you and if you're living the world's ways, it's gonna really go up in smoke, right? If you take it with you. All right, in 18 through 27, John cont contrasts truth and falsehood or lies. So let's look at verse uh, 18. Children, again, this is how he takes and addresses them. It is the last hour, and just as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. All right, the last hour, of course, refers to the entire period between the first and second coming of Christ, or really from the time he ascended to the time where he will come in the air and call us home. Well, that's the last time. Then you have the tribulation time, and then you'll have the millennial reign. So John wrote about Antichrist, as we looked at in Revelation. There, there will be one whom the world will, uh, will be led to worship. But John here says here, and in Revelation, there are many Antichrists that have already appeared, and we've had some in our day. Probably have some too today. Uh, an antichrist is somebody who opposes Christ, opposes his life, opposes his teaching. Uh, the Gnostics that John was writing again, they oppose the incarnation of Christ Jesus, of his coming to the earth in the flesh. Uh, they claim flesh was evil, so Jesus was only in spirit because spirit was good. Well, if that's the case, he didn't die, he wasn't buried, and he didn't rise, so we got to pay for our own sins. If he only came in the Spirit. Uh, because these types of claims were being made, John says, this is how we know we're in the last days. you got people who are opposing the Word of God, who are opposing Christ, etc., and so forth. And then look at verse 19. They, talking about the Antichrist, they went out from us, but we're not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they will all, excuse me, that they all are not of us. Sometimes. All those they's are referring to Antichrist, are referring to the world, and Satan's followers. Okay, all those they's. So they uh, are in the church. Antichrist were in the church, are in the church. They're among believers, but they have gone out, he says, to show they were not true Christians. Uh, they don't always stay in the church. I'll go in, mess one up, and then leave, go somewhere else, and you know, uh, do that as far as today. The the biblical uh, example I thought of was Ananias and Sapphira in uh, Acts 5. They're in the church. Everybody, it says, is united. They're selling this and that, bringing it, maybe for missions to help meet needs in around or anybody in the church, probably in the community or in Jerusalem. Ananias and Sapphira, they sell some property. Ananias brings it before Peter. Peter, here, here's my uh, what I made off the piece of property we sold, but he lies. You know, I said he sold it for ten, but he said he only claims five. Peter says, Why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? He dies. They bury him. A few hours later, Sapphira comes in. Peter says, Come here, I want to ask you a question. Did you sell that property for five thousand? Full well knowing it was for ten. And I'm just putting the numbers in. She says, Yes, 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 that's how much. Boom. She dies. They went out. Because they were not of the church. They were of the world. You see it? They were of the world. They wanted to pocket some of that money. And, and I know I, I, when I preach this, to me, if they had come to Peter and said, Peter, look, we've got bills, house needs working, fixing up. Here's half and been honest. I don't think they would have done it. But they tried to lie. You're not going to lie to God. And as I said then, uh, the church, this was early in the time of the church, so 
God was not going to allow it to be destroyed and bad seed, so to speak, get in it right then. Now look at 20 through 27. I really need bigger print on these numbers. All right, verse 20. But you have, talking to believers, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, know the truth, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The one who denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide remain in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I, John, have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As you, as for you, the anointing, which is of the Holy One, which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide or remain in him. All right. You, Christian, believer, you have an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You believe, you have the Holy, the Holy Spirit with you. Uh, John wrote not to tell the truth, but to remind them of the truth to clear up any misunderstandings that they might have had. Now he reviews, liars deny Christ or any part of the teaching about him. Those who do this are antichrist, okay? They're of the world, they're opposed to Christ. To deny the Son is to deny God the Father. To confess faith in the Son is to have, have the Father. You can't separate them. If you believe in the Son, you have the Father. If you don't believe, you don't have the Father. Uh, abide meaning to remain uh, in what you have heard from the beginning, which will be the gospel truth of Christ Jesus. He says, do not waver, for we have the promise from God, from Christ to us who believe and remain, which is our eternal life. So John wrote to warn as well as to inform the church that those who are in and outside the church trying to deceive them. But all Christians have the Holy Spirit with them to guide and direct them and to let them know truth from lies. This is what the Holy Spirit, for it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us today all things. Gospel of John 16, 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, Remember, this is Jesus talking before Pentecost. So when he comes, and he's already come for us, he, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. How does the Holy Spirit hear so that he can speak? Spirit's got a very complex look. How would the Holy Spirit hear what God has to say if he only speaks based upon what he hears? How's he going to hear? On his part of God. Okay. But if he's going to guide us, and his guidance is based off of what he hears from us, how would he hear? Pray. What's that? Have to pray. Okay. True. But we're talking about not so much the Holy Spirit and God and Christ as the relationship to us. 
individual. Two individuals. One reads their Bible every day. One barely opens it when they're in church. Who's going to know more of the Word of God? The one who reads it or the one who does not? So if the one who reads it constantly, daily, is feeding himself God's Word, is he giving the Holy Spirit a lot to work with? Yes. So when you're tempted, Holy Spirit might bring this verse back to mind where you go, you know, get away from me, Satan, get behind me, Satan. But if you only open it in Sunday school and you're not really even reading it or in worship and you're just kind of paying halfway attention, are you giving him a lot to work with? No. Now does it make sense? Verse 16, when the Holy, when he, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative. He's not going to go, Calvin, don't you know what the Bible says? But whatever he hears, doesn't have to necessarily hear here, but what we read, pay attention right now. <laughs> uh, maybe you're listening to other pastors or Bible teachers or you're reading Christian books, or you're reading through the Bible, that's the Holy Spirit. He's soaking it up. So that, I mean, have you ever been talking to somebody, maybe trying to witness to them, and a verse comes to your mind that you just hadn't thought of in years? Where does it come from? Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit couldn't bring it to your mind if he hadn't heard it from you. Okay? Everybody looks a little bit easier now, not quite as confused as what you were. So what should our relationship with sin be like? It should not be no relationship. Shouldn't be. We should hate it. Hate it. And when we do sin, what should we do? Confess and repent. Confess and repent. Uh, what happens when we sin? Welches, quenches the Holy Spirit. What else? Anything? Kill your witness. Kill your witness. Kill your witness. Separates, separates us from God. Separates us from God. And if you're separated from God, what does that make you? Uh, blank of God. Uh, enemy of God. <coughs> if you're not in a relationship, you're an enemy of God. You got any family members, friends, neighbors, close friends that are lost? They're an enemy of God. Next time you see them, think of, think of them that way. So how do light and darkness relate to love and hate? Do they relate? How do they relate? They coexist. Okay. Say it again, please. As long as you are in that light, that love is there. Okay, so light and love. So I'm assuming hate and darkness go together, right? They're opposites, right? They're opposites. You cannot, can you have darkness and light in the same room? You might have sh some shadows, but I mean, it, you know, if this is the middle, could this side be in total darkness and this side be in light? No. Not unless you build a wall down there. What about love and hate? Can you say I love this person but hate this person? No. no. You can it's say it, but... Yeah, you can say it, <laughs> but what's on the inside? Yes, sir. You can love them. Yeah. Not like what they do. Yeah. Well, as I said, we are commanded to love everybody. You might not like them. You might not like what they stand for, what they do, you know, Somebody who's a drug addict, we're to love them. Amen. We should not necessarily, no, we should not like what they do as far as being a drug addict or an alcoholic or a wife beater or somebody who causes strife or a gossip or a glut. We shouldn't like what they do, but we are to love them. <laughs> Is that easy to do in every case? No. The only way we can do it is we're filled with the love of God as we saw in chapter 1. Uh, what would hating a fellow believer say about an individual's walk with God? 
I love everybody in this room except for Jesse. What does that say about my relationship with God? I love you, brother, brother. You're not walking with God. But I, it's all but one person. That's right, it doesn't. We're fooling ourselves. <laughs> or the individual will be fooling themselves. If you say, I love everybody, but I hate this person. You can't have love and hate. Um, so what are we commanded to not love? The world. The world. The scripture says, and what we do, do not love the world. Because who's the prince of, of this world? And Satan is evil. So what practical steps can we take to avoid falling in love with this world and the things that are in it? Practical steps. Stay in God's word. Stay in the word. Pray. 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 What was, did you say something else? Go to church. Go to church. Fellowship with Christians. And I'm going to add to pray and read the Bible. Do it daily. If you do it once a month, might not be so good. <clears throat> Society today wants us all to, to be all inclusive in matters of religion. The basic idea is that all religions and belief systems are equally correct and valid. That's what society, the world, says. The only thing that invalidates a religion is its claim to exclusivity only. Jesus made the claim that the only way anybody can come to the Father, come to heaven, is through him, exclusively through him. Yet society wants us to deny this truth and to fully accept all other belief systems as ways to God to heaven. There is pressure in all religious circles to do this for the ones who do accept this many ways to heaven is what John is saying about them. What are we to do? Only one way, right? Don't waver. Don't waver. Think about, as we'll close up here tonight, Think about um, differences in denominations, in churches, uh, different beliefs, and how they've changed in the last 50 years. What kind of preachers did you hear 50 years ago? Hellfire and brimstone. Okay. That's what I got written down, brother. What kind of preachers... Well, do you have as many Hellfire Brimstone preachers today? What kind of preachers do we hear, especially if you watch them on TV or listen to them? What kind of preachers do, do, we, do we find? Feel-good message. Feel-good message. I wrote down seekers. Seeker messages. Um, Self-serving. Yes. Um... Fifty years ago, how active were churches in, in their communities? Where I grew up, it was pretty much a center of the community. That in the local country store. What about today? Just another building on the road. Another building on the road. Too Some people wouldn't even know what it was. Hmm? Too many worldly activities that 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 people, including some churches. If you don't have anything else to do, come to church. <laughs> but they always find I'm something else to do, uh, right? The they, world attitude. They always find something else to do. Yeah. Oh, it's rainy today. We're not coming. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't get to bed till after midnight. I'm not coming. And, and the pastors of the church have changed. Inspirational speakers. What? Inspirational they don't speakers. Me. What do you call 
Joel Holstein. Heresy. Yes. A heretic. Smiley. He, he's a uh, health, wealth, gospel. Yep. He wants to believe everything's going to be. Just, just put a smile on your face and all will be wonderful. I, I suspect his teeth cost more than some people's houses. <laughs> Again, that's just my thought. And gays are leaving the church. Yep. You have, like I said, think about some denominations. 50 years ago, you weren't coming, if you were a homosexual, a gay, and you don't hear that word gay too much anymore. You would be in the closet. You would be in the closet. They were just really starting to come out. It was more like New York City, San Francisco, your, your larger cities where they were coming. Not in, you know, Greensboro, North Carolina, right? But today, and I, I don't know for sure, but I would not be surprised if Greensboro got a couple of uh, homosexuals in their pulpit. And it's not just one denomination. Some of them are, like us, non-denominational or independent churches. Some, a lot of them you'll find Anglican, uh, Episcopal especially, uh, some Presbyterian, some Methodist. There's a big, wide variety. You've got denominations that are doing this. They're splitting over that one issue. Uh, 50 years ago, you didn't see a woman in the pulpit. That's another one. 50 years ago, you did not... I think I've mentioned this uh, church I grew up attending where my father is buried, uh, my grandparents are buried, my brother and my sister's buried, where my mother will be buried. There were men, including my father, that there were some ladies back in when I was probably in my 20s. And wanted, this one particular lady wanted to make her a deacon. No, no, the Bible says no. That very church now not only has one, two, I think four women deacons and a woman pastor. I almost want to dig my daddy up and put him somewhere else. Because I know there's a bunch of men out in that graveyard that have rolled over and over and over. And some of those women, I went to school with. And I thought they knew better. Uh, again, differences 50 years ago. Active in the community, center of the community. Today, as I uh, read a story one time, as far as the, the uh, church in the community, if the church was to burn down, would the community even notice? There's a lot of them probably not. There's a lot of them that probably, oh, where do those ashes come from? You know, that they wouldn't even notice. 50 years ago, churches were family-oriented. You know, you got drugged to church. <laughs> Families went to church together. What about today? What's the uh, orientation of the church today? You have to look around, right? Got families. But you've got to have the fun stuff for the children and the teens. A lot of people... Uh, when they're looking to join a church, I don't care if they're 20 or 120, how do I feel when I leave that church? It has nothing to do with what's taught. It, it, it's more about the feeling. You know, the problem is you might feel wonderful when you leave church, but an hour later, how do you feel? Go back to how we felt before you got to church. And 50 years ago, I would say the churches were biblically based 100% or at least 99. Today, how biblically based are churches? 100%? 10%. 50 years ago, I remember uh, well, it was my mom's first cousin. They went to the Methodist church. I remember going there and thinking, no different. We went to the Baptist church. Really wasn't any different. Today, big difference. And just like you could go to Baptist church A and Baptist church B and be 100% different. Methodist church, Methodist church, different. Non-denominational, non-denominational, independent, independent. 
They could be about as far as the east is from the west in their theology, in their practice, in everything. Why is that? They're not going by God's word. No. So what have they done? Fallen in... Well, they've fallen in love with the world. The world. The world. But the world has been squeezing us into its mold for years centuries to be exact. Are you waving that thing at me as I'm wrong or you got something to say? No, no, no. One of the things you're talking about 50 years ago, to me when I was a kid, the church used to let the Holy Spirit take over. The church went on and on and on because the Holy Spirit was leading. And now it don't take you. See, you, you know what ended that, don't you? Um, the little old man sitting in the back of the church that when the 12 o'clock come, Preacher! <laughs> we got to get to the cafeteria. <laughs> Dad or the couldn't take the kids anymore and said, we got to get out of here. I mean, yeah, it's... So are we all wrong? Because we all participate in all the things we no. sat here and said. <laughs> no, but you'll see next week in chapter 3, and I'll give you a brief summary of that. We are all going to do things of the world? Is it a habitual action or it just happens? See the difference? You got some who habitually make the choice. I'm going to be prideful. And I'm going to boast in everything I have and everything I do. Versus, oh, let me tell you about my accomplishments. If you're walking with God, later on, it might be years, it might be minutes, God's going to say, you were just a little on the prideful side there. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. But if you're not walking with God, it's a habitual habit. You don't listen. You don't hear. You're not giving the Holy Spirit anything to work with. You, the only thing you're giving him to work with, are you giving the devil more things to work with because you're fitting into the mold the world wants us to. I think about, you know, in the last, I don't know, maybe 20 years, since 2000 anyway, same-sex marriage is legalized, right? The only good thing that's happened lately is uh, abortion is more or less outlawed or very limited in most places. Uh, you know, gosh, my brain don't want to work with it. Think of how liberal the world has gotten since the year 2000. But... C couldn't have happened if B hadn't happened before it. And that couldn't have happened if A hadn't happened before it. So it, it's just been, it's a snowball effect. It's going to keep on going. And it's going to keep on going until the trumpet sounds. Christ takes his out of here. And the tribulation starts. And then everybody's going to be in for a big surprise that's left. Any questions, comments? For all you online, we thank you for joining us.